Are you ready? Yeah. Can, I, can I get going? Yeah. I need every minute today, so I hope you put the chicken on extra slow cook. <laughs> and I can see the visitors are sweating already. <laughs> now, let me just give a couple disclaimers uh, for my message today. Uh, called the robe, and uh, the dis first disclaimer is I'm going to share a lot of scriptures, but for sake of time, I cannot read you all the scriptures from the Bible. So I'm going to give you references because it'll take three hours if I give you all, if I actually read all of them to you. Okay? Now I'm happy to do the three hours, but I don't think all of see that was very weak. So I don't think all of you want the three hours. So I'm going to give you many scriptures, and you don't have to write them down if you don't want, but if anybody ever, you know, says, well, that's not scriptural, or where, where did you come up with that, and that's not in the Bible, I'm giving scriptures as much as for you as for any people that want to detract. Do you understand? And if you want to listen to it again, or write them down, or study them on your own, you can. But uh, there'll be many scriptures, I just won't read them all. Praise God. I'm also going to, uh, this is what we call a slow burn firework this morning where I'm going to start a little slow and I'm going to build and build, but it's burning. Don't you worry, it's burning. <laughs> and then all of a sudden uh, we're going to get to what we're trying to talk about, and I think, I think all that prep work will have done its job. Praise God. And you're going to catch something this morning that I trust will be as much of a blessing to you as it was to me when God showed it to me. Uh, last year I preached this in Russia and in California, but this is the first time here in Canada, and it's one of my favorite sermons, so I'm going to have some fun. I hope you'll have some fun with me. Praise God. Amen. My first point is called, It Was a Thursday. Jesus did not die on Good Friday like people think that He did. The reason that people have thought for years when they anglicized this holiday, uh, the Roman Catholic Church specifically, is because of the phrase in the Bible that said they rushed to get His body off the tree before it was Sabbath. And we know Sabbaths or Shabbats in, 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 in the Jewish in the Jewish religion and tradition, is on a Friday night. It starts at sundown on a Friday night and goes into Saturday. Remember, everything with the Jews is different to us, so you have to interpret this from the Jewish perspective. We start our new day at midnight. They start their new day at sundown or 6 p.m., give or take. Sometimes it's earlier, sometimes it's later, depending on the time of the year. But just for, for simplicity's sake, when you hear me say 6 a.m. or 6 p.m., I'm talking about sundown or sunrise. Because the Jewish day starts at 6 p.m. The next day, we do, our, we do our changeover at 12 a.m. They do it at 6 p.m. of the previous day. Do you understand? So, you have to understand that first of all. And so, we see here that uh, there was a uh, Sabbath that was starting Friday night. That's the Sabbath every week. It's the same every week. So, people have thought and assumed that, that He died on a Friday. That's why we call it Good Friday, because they had to get His body off the cross before the Sabbath started. But what, what they didn't recognize and what they didn't understand is that Jews, of course, understand this, that uh, there is a feast, when there's a feast day, there are seven Jewish feasts. Passover is one of those feasts. When there's a feast day, it automatically becomes the Sabbath day. And when there's a feast day, there's more than one Sabbath in that given week. A feast day is called a high day, and it automatically becomes a Sabbath. So when they, when they talked about Jesus dying on Friday, they didn't take into account that there was a feast day in that week, which was Passover. And Passover in this situation uh, started on a Thursday. Now, every Passover, every year, it's the same. It's not the same date in our calendar. But every year, it's the 14th of the month of Nisan. That's, that's the day the lamb was killed. Yeah. Remember God said to Moses, take a lamb, slay it yeah. during the afternoon on the 14th of Nisan, every year without fail, they take lambs, and they would slay them, and they would put the blood on the lintel and the doorposts. Do you remember? The Bible says that they slayed the lamb in a basin. Every Jewish home had a little, a little indentation when you came in the door. You'd wash your feet before you walked in the door. They would slay the lamb in that basin, and there was blood there, and they would dip the hyssop plant, which represents faith, and they would put it on the lintels, and the lintel and the side posts of the house, the door posts and the lintel. And that formed, if you look at that picture, it's, an, it's, a, it's a foreshadowing of the cross, because it shows there was blood at his feet, there was blood at his head, and there was blood at his hands. And so they would put this, they would put the blood there on the 14th day of Nisan, in the afternoon. Because they had to hurry. Because at 6 p.m., the 15th of Nisan began. Remember, I told you it begins in the evening. And the 15th of Nisan is Passover. But they had to kill the lamb and apply the blood before Passover officially started. 
Why is it called Passover? Because the angel of death passed over on the night of the 15th. Yes. Do you understand? Which started at 6 p.m. It ended the 14th and it started the 15th. Are you with me? Yes. So the Passover lamb was slain in that afternoon. The blood was applied and then they had to be in their homes by sundown and they were not allowed to come out or they would die. And they ate the Passover meal. They took the lamb and they roasted it with bitter herbs and all these, and unleavened bread, which spoke, spoke of sinlessness, and they did this whole meal. Now, the Bible clearly says without contradiction that, that what happened here, and I'll give you scripture to prove it, it's, it's absolutely scriptural. That's not my opinion. I know on the internet there's all these people that have different opinions. But there's no way that you can deny what the Bible says. Jesus had to have died on a Thursday. It doesn't, first of all, it doesn't add up number wise and it doesn't add up scripture wise. So let me tell you this, because I'm going to read some stuff just because, uh, you know, there's a lot of information here. So as I said to you, uh, there were two Sabbaths back to back. Thursday night was the Sabbath called the Passover. Friday night at 6 p.m. was the regular Sabbath. Two Sabbaths back to back. Now, in, uh, in Matthew 28, 1, later on, you don't have to look up all these scriptures. I'm just going to tell them to you. In Matthew 28, 1, it says, Mary Magdalene came early in the morning. Remember, she was looking for Jesus, and then she said, after the Sabbath. But the Greek word for Sabbath is the word, it's pluralized. It's the word Sabbaths. In the Greek, in English it says Sabbath, but in the Greek it says Sabbaths. So there were two Sabbaths that had happened that weekend, and she was coming on the Sunday after the Sabbaths. Do you understand? Jesus is the Passover lamb. He called himself the lamb that was slain. It wouldn't make sense for him to die at a different time than when the, when the Passover lambs were being slaughtered. In the temple they were slaughtering lambs at the exact same time that Jesus was on the cross. He died on the 14th of Nisan preparing for Passover that would begin at 6 p.m. that night, technically the 15th of Nisan. Now we can prove this further. John 18, 28, you can look at it later. It says clearly that when they were leading, when, when, if you saw it in the movie on Friday night, that movie was not accurate on one point. Because the Bible says that when those Sanhedrin and the Caiaphas and all his people were taking Jesus from Caiaphas's place and from uh, Herod's temple and, go, you know, courtyard and going to the hall of judgment, the Roman hall of judgment, which is where Pontius Pilate was. It clearly says in that verse that they did not enter into the hall of judgment. They were not permitted to come onto Gentile property or they would be un deemed unclean and defiled. And the Bible says they did not enter the hall of judgment. Pontius Pilate had to come out and talk to them. They were not allowed to enter into Roman territory for the Bible says they would be defiled and would not be able to eat the Passover that night. It says it right there in the Bible. So that morning had to have been a Thursday because Passover started Thursday at 6 p.m. And they weren't allowed to defile themselves before the Passover started. I can see some of you are thinking, oh, I smell heresy in the wind. <laughs> Praise God. It's not heresy. It's just the truth. It's just that we, we got so many traditions. Yeah. Jesus wasn't born December 25th either. In fact, that was a demon-possessed man named Nimrod's birthday. But that's not a big deal because we're still celebrating our Savior's birth. It don't matter where, really what day of... He was actually born in the springtime, theologians tell us, when the lambs were born. And he died in the springtime too. There weren't three wise men either. There was hundreds of them. They shook a city. There was three gifts, not three wise... We had all these weird traditions that somebody who was smoking pot years ago <laughs> created. All right? Jesus did not die on Good Friday. He died but the day the lambs were slaughtered, which was the 14th day of Nisan. And later that night, which is technically the 15th, that evening when they ate the Passover meal, he was already dead at that time. Do you understand? We see this very clearly from John 18, 28. Now, interestingly, every year Nisan is determined, the, the, the dates are determined not by the Gregorian calendar, which is what we use, but by the Hebrew calendar. And it's all based on moon movements. It has to coincide with full moons, etc., etc. And so I, on every year, 14th and 15th of Nisan are on different days. The year Jesus died, it was a Thursday. And because he rose the first day of the week, the Bible says. And remember, God rested on the seventh day. Do you remember? And he called it the Sabbath, the day of rest. The seventh day is the Saturday. That's right. And the Bible clearly says all through the Bible that the first day of the week was Sunday. So we know that when Mary came the first day of the week, it was Sunday, which was resurrection morning. 
On that year, the way the Nissan calendar worked, it fell that the 14th was a Thursday and then the first day was a Sunday. But this year in 2019, the 14th of Nissan was actually yesterday. So yesterday during Good Friday, not yesterday, yesterday was Saturday, Friday when we were here watching the movie and when we were doing our day, that was the 14th of Nissan for 2019. That was the day that Jesus would have died if it was in this year. You have, to say, you have to look at a Hebrew calendar if you're going to match it up properly. But in the year that Jesus died, it was a Thursday. And so, I just, I'm sharing some of these things because I really, it gets me annoyed when people on the basics of the gospel don't even know what's going on. This is basic. You have to understand the basics of what Jesus did for us. So, we see that he, he, he on this day, John 20 verse 1, it says that Mary came on the first day of the week, so we know it was Sunday. So we know, what, what have we learned? We know one thing, He died, according to Scripture, He died on a Thursday, and He resurrected on a Sunday, according to Scripture. Now, Matthew 12, 40, if you don't mind, I'll read that one to you. I'm not going to read every one, but I will read that one. Matthew 12 and verse 40. Matthew 12 and verse 40, and the Bible says Jesus is speaking, and He's prophesying about His death. And He says these words, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Do you see there that he said three days and three nights? You, you are all with me? Yeah. You haven't gone to sleep yet, have you? No. Three days and three nights. The only way that you can match the three days and three nights is if he died on a Thursday. Plus we have the Scripture proving it in John 18 that they went and took him to be killed before the Passover meal which started that night. So we know it was a Thursday. So what happened? Because remember it's 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. These are the times that it works with them. So they, so on, when was the Last Supper? It was Wednesday night. And then early into Thursday morning he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Do you remember that? And he was, he was praying. The word Gethsemane in the Hebrew is Gat Shemin. The word Gat is press and the word Shemin is olive. It's an olive press. He was pressed upon the rock of agony in that garden as he was praying and, and he sweated as though it were great drops of blood. That was early Thursday morning before daybreak had even happened. And then they came and they arrested him and Judas kissed him and betrayed him and then they take him and they take him to Caiaphas and they're beating him and they're doing this and then they take him to the Pontius Pilate and then they take him to Herod and then they take him back to All of that is happening in the early morning hours of Thursday. Do you understand? Then they take him to be crucified. At 9 a.m. he's on the cross and he dies at 3 p.m. He's on there for six hours in agony on the cross. Remember what happened at noon? The sky went dark. Oh my God. Let me say this to you. Day one he died at 3 o'clock on Saturday. Well the day doesn't end until 6 p.m. So even though it wasn't a full day it's still considered part of a day. That was day one. The day that he died, Thursday. When was night one? Thursday night to Friday morning. That was night one. When was day two? Friday morning to Friday evening. That's day two. Day three, Friday evening to Saturday morning. The right, that's night two. Then we got day, what am I, day three is Saturday morning to Saturday evening. That, remember it's 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's how they work it. And then night three, remember he said, I'm three days in the, in, the, in the belly of the earth like Jonah was. You have to do it so that there's three nights or it doesn't work. But from Saturday night to Sunday morning was the third night. And he said, I will rise yeah. after three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And that's why Sunday morning was the first time at daybreak was technically the beginning of that. He had completed three days and three nights and he rose from the dead. I say this first point so you understand clearly with scriptural proof, not just with traditions of men, how it worked when Jesus died so that we understand. I don't want to get into legalism here because it's not about legalism, but I just think you should know. So a lot of people ask me, but it doesn't, add, it doesn't add up, Pastor. If we do it on Friday, it doesn't add up. And so, so many people have asked me that over the years. I thought, well, maybe I'll just say it because I don't normally talk about this kind of stuff. But I just say it so that you understand how the math works and what the Bible says. Jesus died on a Thursday, at least the year that He, in that year, which was Nisan 14, and He became the Lamb that was slain. And I just think it's such beautiful symbolism. While they were slaying the lambs in the temple court, Jesus was being slain outside Jerusalem. 
It's a perfect picture and a perfect parallel. So we see now he's in the garden early Thursday morning. Can you go on a journey with me in your mind today? Early in the morning, he's there praying and agonizing. And as the high priest would go in once a year and sprinkle blood seven times on the mercy seat, so Jesus, as the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, also shed seven sheddings of blood. It's a perfect parallel to the high priest in the natural. What was the first shedding? His mind. He, he sweat as though it were great drops of blood. And I've read stories about a judge in South Africa who was under such pressure in his office. Men's lives were in his hands with death penalties pending. And he was under such pressure when his secretary came in. His sweat, had, he had broken the blood vessels. He was under such pressure and his sweat was actually turned into blood. It is possible medically that you can be under such mental pressure that you can actually sweat blood. It is medically proven. Jesus shed blood from his mind from his head, which represents and symbolizes his thought life. He shed blood, listen to me, with schizophrenia and bipolar on the rise and torment of all kinds and being more, we're seeing it more today than we've ever seen it. Yeah. In our lifetimes at least, yeah. Jesus bled from his mind yes, so that your mind would be free. Yeah. He went through agony in that garden so that people that have, that have torments in their mind would be free. See, there has to be a shedding of blood for the remission of sin and sickness. The second shedding, remember the priest did it seven times, was they put, they beat his face. They beat it with rods, the Bible said. They beat it with their hands. They'd say, tell us who prophesied. And they'd punch him and they'd blindfold him. And the Bible says they took, a, they took his beard and they plucked it out. Now, I don't know if you've, nobody here has ever gone through that kind of agony, but just pulling out one hair is painful, let alone an entire beard. And they beat him mercilessly with their fists until his eyes were swollen. Why? Because in the Bible, face always speaks of righteousness. When, you, when your face is darkened, it represents that you're not right with God. You're not righteous. Jesus bled from his face. He became ugly in his countenance so that my face would shine, so that I could live right and pure and holy before him. Blood was shed for his face, for my face, or for my righteousness. Then, of course, they put the crown of thorns upon his head. Remember when God cursed it in Genesis 3, he said, let thorns and thistles come up. That's part of the curse. It's not, it's not accidental that they took thorns, which represent the curse of the law, and they weaved it into a crown as a mockery. And the Bible didn't say they put it on his head. It said that they beat him with a reed for the thorns to go into his skull. There was great blood and great pain as he bore on his head that curse so that we would be curse free. Blood was shed from his head so that our life would be without the curse. What well, was the fourth shedding? And probably in some ways the most gruesome, at least on the movie it was, when they whipped us back with that cat of nine tails 39 times because at 40 you'd die. They brought him right to the edge of death. And they whipped him because medical science says there's 39 major categories of disease today. For every strike he took care of an entire category of disease. No matter what you ever face physically. He, he bore it for you. They furrowed his back, the Bible says, like, 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 like a field that has been furrowed and plowed because his back looked like it had been plowed with that whip. He did that awful sacrifice and blood flowed like a river so that no matter what you ever faced physically, you could stand your ground and say, he took it for me. Blood was shed for me. I will not die of cancer. I will not die of leukemia. I will not have the flu. I will not have migraine headaches. Every mental torment he took, every act for, for sin and righteousness, he took it. All of our curse and our poverty, he took it. All of our physical healing, he took it on his back. And then he gets to number five where they, where they pierce his hands with those awful nails. Jesus appeared to Dr. Dufresne about not six or seven times. And every time he's appeared to him, Dr. Dufresne would tell me, he said, he's still got those holes in his hands, Greg. He said, you'll see them when you get to heaven. And he says, they're huge. He says, they're like, they're like, they're like the, those nails you put in the, in the railroad uh, pins. He said, you can see the light shining through it. Our hands represent what we do for God. He bled from his hands so that what we do, yes. that we could work for God yeah. with fullness. He bled from his feet because it represents our walk with God and our intimacy with God. He bled so that we would be intimate with him. And then probably my favorite, if I could say it, I don't think it's, I don't know, it's just, it's very interesting. Then after he had died, they pierced him with that, with that spear. Do you remember that? And out of it came blood and water. This is a beautiful symbolism of how the church was birthed. 
It had to be birthed through blood, just like your healing had to be paid for with blood. Everything has to be paid for with blood. That's the way God works. Jesus bled these seven areas so that your whole entire existence would be secure. Remember the first Adam, God put him in a deep sleep, he opened up his side, and he took out a rib, and it became his bride. Well, the, Jesus is called the second Adam. He was also in a deep sleep called death. And after he had died, God, through that soldier, opened up that side, and blood and water flowed. It symbolized the church coming out from beside his heart and being birthed just like that rib formed the bride of Christ. So the church, the bride of the Lord Jesus Christ, came forth with that shedding of blood from his side. He took your mental, He took your sin, He took your curse, He took your physical sickness, He took all that you needed to work for Him with, for, with, with all your might. He took what you needed so that you would have an intimate walk with Him, and He paid the price so that you'd be part of the church. Right. Seven sheddings of perfect blood. Seven is the number of completion and the number of covenant. Praise God. Number two, it is finished. Yeah. Do you remember that He made seven statements on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Truly I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. The first one I believe he was probably saying as they, as they nailed him in that excruciating agony. We don't know exactly when he said it, but he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Then he said to that, that thief, the one was mocking him, and the other said was humbling himself, and he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Then John is there with Mary, his mother. And the third statement, he said, woman, this is your son. This is your mother. He was taking care of his mom, Amen. even then. He, was not, he, he did not want to leave any stone unturned. He wanted the responsibility for his mother to pass to somebody that he trusted. Number four, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? Why? Because God, because he had become sin, had to turn from him. He couldn't look at him because he had become so revolting in God's sight because of sin. And he was aware that God had abandoned him. And he said, why have you forsaken me? The fifth statement, he says, I thirst. That was the first time maybe and the only time in those seven statements he referred to his physical condition. But it wasn't just that he thirsted physically, obviously it was, but I believe it also meant I thirst spiritually. Yeah. Remember he said to the lady at the well, he said, I'll give you living water and you'll thirst no more. Yeah. I believe because he was cut off from that living relationship with his father, that his spirit man was thirsting after God. Because he had just said, you've forsaken me, God. And then he says, I thirst. The sixth statement, he says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Luke's uh, uh, gospel records that as the last statement, but both uh, John and Matthew's gospel recorded as the second last statement. It doesn't really matter what the order was. But he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then according to Matthew and John, the last statement that he made, and it's the only statement that he shouted, all the others he spoke. But the Bible says he cried out with a loud voice, now think about the pain, the agony, the suffering, the weakness. Think about everything that he had gone to to muster the strength to shout. At that moment is an astonishing fact in and of itself. And he shouts these words, Tetelestai. And that means it is finished in Aramaic. It is finished. Praise God. This is found in John 19, verse 28 and 30, and also Matthew 27 and verse 50. Now, what did he mean by it is finished? You have to understand this or you won't understand what's going on here. He's not talking about redemption, the plan being finished. Why? Because he could not finish redemption until he rose. See, he's, he has to, he's not in victory yet. He has to rise in victory and put his blood on the mercy seat. And according to Hebrews 8.1, he has to sit down upon the throne the Father gave him. Only when he sat down upon the throne was their final victory. So he couldn't be saying it's finished. In other words, everything, like it's all over. What, what did he mean when he said it's finished? Because there's still more that has to happen. But it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful, let me explain it to you. When we sin, what's on our head? The wages of sin. What are the wages of sin? Death. death. What does death mean? Physical death, yes. But death means in the Greek spiritual separation from God. It means spiritual death, not just physical death. Are you with me? Yes, sir. I know you're all listening, but you're not bored, are you? No. So smile once in a while so I know that you're okay. The wages of sin is not just physical death, it's spiritual death. As well as, as and meaning when you've got spiritual death, you physically die. But when you have spiritual death, that happens after 
you physically die. Why? Because your spirit man goes down to hell and is separated from God. Spiritual death means spiritual separation in the original language. So it's not just the physical death, there's a spiritual death that has to be incurred as well in order for him to be our substitutionary sacrifice. So Jesus bore all of our sin and sickness, poverty and curse while he was alive on the cross. Do you remember 2 Corinthians 5, 21? It says, he became sin who knew no sin. Didn't say he had sin. It said he became sin. Do you remember what John 3, 14 and 15 says? As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. What was that serpent made of bronze? Bronze speaks of judgment. Snake is, 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 is what is, is detestable to God. Satan is represented by the snake in the Garden of Eden. Why would he say, look upon a snake? Because it looks like that's a disgusting thing to look upon. But God told Moses as a foreshadowing of Jesus, I want you to put a snake up. It's got to be a bronze pole because it represents judgment. And if they look upon that snake, they'll be healed. Amen. Jesus said, I am he that was lifted up in the wilderness. Jesus is saying in John 3, 14, I am the snake. I am about to become the snake. He didn't, he didn't look like a snake. He became a snake. I know it's hard for our sensibilities to accept that. But Jesus could not just take and he had to become sin. Why else would God turn away? If he was just holding sin, God could look at him. I have sin and God still looks at me. He became the epitome of sin. He became an ugly snake. He became sin for 2 Corinthians 5.21. He became the one that the judgment of God, the fire of his wrath poured upon. He was burnt with the judgment of God on the cross and he became sin, which is why God said, I cannot look at you. And he was abandoned. My God. You got to remember that he took, he didn't just take it, he became your sin. Look at that. So when Jesus did all of this and he became sin, what happened? He's doing it when? While he's alive. He's still breathing on the earth when he took all of this. So the wages of sin is death physical, but it's also spiritual separation from God, meaning hell. He had to go down. I know other denominations don't teach this, but they haven't read their Bible. He had to go down to the under parts of the earth. Because if he only took my sin, became sin for me while he was alive, he only had done half of it. What is the consequence of my sin? Not just physical death, but spiritual separation in hell from God. He, as he was alive, he took my sin, he became sin, and he physically died. But he had to continue and complete the exercise. He had to go into hell and have spiritual separation from God. He had to pay that for me or I would have to go there. Do you understand? He bore my sickness so I would be free of sickness. He went to hell so I don't have to go to hell unless I choose to go. And if they don't accept Jesus out there, that's where they're going. You know, the Pope last year in April 2018 had made an official statement from the Vatican, there is no more hell. And, un and people that are of not of our persuasion, the ungodly, he said, at the time of death, they simply disappear. CNN were having interviews about it. I was watching and the guy, the CNN interviewer said, this is good news for me because I've always been worried about hell. Now I know I just, there's no, I'm just going to disappear. He's going to have a rude awakening if he doesn't receive Jesus. In a letter called the, the, the Joy of Love, the Pope wrote a letter to the church at large called The Joy of Love last year. I don't encourage you to read it, but if you want to, it's online. In that he basically said, sin is no more. Sin is subjective. No priest is ever allowed again to tell somebody that they've done something wrong because sin is now a subjective issue. It may not be sin after all, and we don't know, so you can't tell somebody they've sinned. Wow. He's telling that there's no sin, and he's telling that there's no hell. And he's the leader of the largest church on the planet. We are in the last days. Yeah. Let me tell you, there is sin because Jesus had to bear it. Yeah. And there is a hell because Jesus went there. And there's no equivocation about that. So what does this mean? He went down to hell to suffer spiritual death and separation from God. He had to go to hell or I would have to go. So why did he say it is finished? What he meant was there's nothing more that I can do on earth. Everything that I can do with breath in my lungs has been accomplished. Now, the only thing left is my spirit goes down and I'm there. But listen, there's nothing more Jesus could do. He is at the mercy of the Holy Ghost from this moment forward. The Holy Ghost is the only one that can visit the caverns of hell and raise him up. 
That's why he said it is finished, not that the covenant had been ratified fully, but he was saying everything I can do has been done. I know some of you don't think about this, but I need you to think about this for a second. There was a possibility redemption could fail. The only way redemption could fail was based on Jesus' will. Jesus, the Bible says in Matthew 26, verse 53, as they are arresting him, and he heals the man's ear that Peter cut off. As they are arresting him, he says to them, I could call of my father, and he would give me more than 12 legions of angels. Why do you come at me like this? If I want to, I can kill all of you. I'm par- he didn't say that, but I'm paraphrasing. What he means is, I've got power that you don't know about. What Jesus was saying is, any time I choose, yeah. I can get out of this. Do you remember he said, my life to lay down and my life to take up. You can't take it from me. I lay it down. Jesus was the boss through all of this. We look at him like the devil was in charge. The devil was not in charge. Jesus was in charge. He was willingly and choosingly to lay down his life. But listen, listen to me. He said to the prayer in the garden of Gethsemane, not my will. Let this chalice pass, but not my will. Thy will be done. He was yielding his will to that other father. But let me tell you something. If on that cross he had decided, enough. I can't take this separation from you anymore. I've never been separated you in eternity. This is the first time I don't feel your presence. If he had decided, enough. And he had called forth those angels. They would have taken him off that tree. And I would be on my way to hell as would you. The only thing that could cause redemption to fail is the will of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is why he had to, we had to wait. He couldn't make the statement until all things had been accomplished. He had to choose to stay on that tree. He had to choose to suffer for me and you. And when he had chosen not to abort the plan of God, and it was now at the very end, then he could say, all that I am able to do for you, humanity, has been done. It is finished in terms of my part on the earth. Do you understand? Now he goes down. Now he can't do anything because he, he, he's at the mercy of the Holy Ghost. But praise God, there's a good news for us. Jesus never failed when he could have failed, but he chose not to. He stayed on that cross. And let me tell you this, the Holy Ghost won't fail. And the Holy Ghost can't fail because he's God. So as soon as Jesus said it's finished, he meant it's all done as far as I'm concerned. What I can do, it's done. Now the rest is up to the Holy Ghost to raise me up. But because the Holy Ghost can't fail, victory is sure. Are you getting this? Why do you think the Roman soldier, the centurion, when he heard him say, Tetelestai with a loud voice, only then did he say he must be the Son of God? Because in the Roman, this is, people don't understand all of this, but in the Roman wars, and I've studied this, in Roman wars, and that centurion would have probably fought in Roman wars, because he was a centurion. You don't get to be a centurion overnight. He would have done his job as a foot soldier. In Roman wars, when they were fighting the barbarians and all the different ones they were fighting, the general was always on a horse, and he was always on an elevated position, and he would scope the battle. And when he could see that his numbers outweighed the other numbers, when he knew even though the victory is not 100% done, we've still got some mopping up to do, but I can tell by, by battle strategy there is no way we can lose this war. When he knew, when the general on the horse saw that he knew 100% guaranteed victory is sure, he would call out, he would call out the phrase, it is finished. It's not finished because we still got some men to kill. But when the soldiers heard the general cry, it is finished. Sometimes they would cry, Roma victor. In other words, victory is sure for Rome. Either, either expression was interchangeable. When the soldier heard the general cry, strength filled him. Because he knew, we've won. There may be 20 more people in front of me, but you know what? We've won. He won't call it unless it's a done deal. We've won. That is why the Roman general, the Roman centurion stands there and he sees this man grotesque. The Bible says didn't even look like a human being. He was covered with all the dirt of sin and humanity. His body was beaten beyond description. He had been sitting there lying there for hours, hanging for hours, trying to breathe. And he makes one final effort and he fills his lungs with air and he cries out with a loud voice, Tetelestai. And the Roman general, the Roman centurion looks at him and goes, I've heard that before. 
He was so moved by that statement because it was a statement with a cry. It wasn't just a statement. He cried it. He shouted it. In other words, he saw this man broken and beaten, looked like he had failed, like he'd lost the battle, but he's crying the cry of victory. And he says, this must be the general of God because only the general can shout that cry. This must be the son of God. That's why, because the Roman general understood the phrase, it is finished. Why did he say it's finished? It's finished for all I can do. There's still some more that has to be done though. And I'm going to go down to hell and I'm going to finish it. My God, my goodness. At 12 noon it went dark. Can you imagine? I'm sure the darkness and the earthquake helped the Roman centurion too. (laughs) When you see an earthquake and it's been dark at noon for three hours, something supernatural is happening. I won't get into it, but astronomically, if you look from the moon back to earth, a reverse eclipse is what occurred. The planets aligned exactly at 3 p.m., causing the passion lamb's heart in the Aries constellation. Study it. You'll see what I'm saying is true. The Aries constellation is called the ram or the passion lamb. At exactly 3 p.m. on the 14th of Nisan, the, 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 the part in the, in the, where, where the heart is located in the, in the ram, it went black at exactly 3 p.m. because of the alignments of the celestial bodies. And this you can watch this if you're interested. It's a fascinating video. For those of you that are interested, it's called Bethlehem Star Bonus Feature on YouTube. You can watch about how the heart of the Lamb goes black at 3 p.m. on the 14th of Nisan. That is the moment that Jesus died. Even the celestial bodies pay tribute to the Son of the living God. How much more a Roman centurion? Bethlehem Star bonus feature on YouTube. What else happened? At that moment, the veil was ripped. God knew that redemption hadn't been ratified, but what God was saying is, victory is sure. Jesus was saying, it's guaranteed. It's not done yet. I'm still going to go down, but because the Holy Ghost can't fail. I'm the only one that could fail, and I have not failed. It is a guaranteed victory. And at that moment, God, knowing that victory was sure, ripped the temple from the top to the bottom, six feet in width. Nobody could even get to the top, let alone rip it. God's hand ripped that. For two reasons, because when a father's son would die in Jewish culture, they would rip their garment from the top to the bottom as a sign of grieving. And God was grieving over the death of his son, and he ripped that temple, that veil. But it's more than that. What he was saying is, because victory is guaranteed, I no longer have to have a priest come to me on behalf of the people. I no longer have to keep them outside. I can fellowship with them directly. That is why the Catholic Church has missed the basic premise of the gospel. You do not need to go and confess to a priest. That is why they rip, it was ripped, so that God was saying, you don't need to go through a person anymore. You come directly to me. I don't need to keep you at bay, away from my presence, lest it kills you. I'm about to live in your heart. My God. We have to remind ourselves of these truths, don't we? Woo, glory. Point number three, hell. At 9 a.m. he's on the cross. At 12 noon it goes dark. At 3 he goes down. His spirit descends. Sin took hold on the cross, but now death took hold as he went to hell. He had to go to pay my price. Jesus goes into the caverns of hell. He had to suffer spiritual separation from God in hell, otherwise he could not be my full substitute. Now Ephesians 4, 9, listen, people that argue, people still argue with me. He didn't go to hell. Oh, uh, my, my pastor, when I was a kid, said he didn't go to hell. Maybe your pastor was an idiot. Maybe he can't read. Read your Bible. Instead of listening to what some preacher tells you, if it's not scriptural. Ephesians 4 verse 9 clearly and unequivocally states that he descended into hell before he ascended up to heaven in order to fulfill all things. It says it right there. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9 it says clearly that he tasted death for us but he did not partake long. He tasted it for us. He had to taste it, but it doesn't mean he stayed long. Now, I won't get into it for sake of time, but there was something in the Old Testament called the scapegoat. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I've read many, many commentaries for many hours on this, and it's a shocking, Reverend Dan, how the theologians of today, even today, are still saying in the commentaries, at least the ones that I read, we don't understand why. We don't understand why. Jewish people didn't understand why. Theologians don't understand why. I understand why, because I've got the Holy Ghost, and he's smarter than a theologian. 
they would take a goat. The high priest would lay hands upon the goat and confer all the sins of the people onto that goat. Because a goat is an animal of sin, not like a lamb. That's right. It's a despised animal. Then the priest would want to kill the goat, but the instruction of God came, do not kill the goat. Let the goat wander in the dry places of the wilderness, do not kill it. And in the Hebrew it speaks of those dry places of the wilderness represent away from life and the land of the living. They would put them out in the desert, wandering away from life and the land of the living with all the sin of the people conferred upon Him. This is a perfect picture of Jesus. Jesus took all the sin of the world upon Him on the cross. He was that goat that it was conferred onto. Are you listening? But then it didn't end there. See, if they killed the goat, it would have ended. It did not end just when the sin came on Him. No, he, they made sure the goat had to stay alive. This is where they don't understand why did God keep the goat alive with all that sin? You should have killed the goat. But it was a picture and a symbolic type of Jesus. He was going to take all the sin of the earth on him, all the sin of past, present, and future humanity. And then he couldn't end there. He had to wander in the wilderness away from the land of the living. He had to go symbolically to hell. If you were trying to think of anything what would symbolize in the natural realm hell, you would think a dry wasteland desert where there is no life. He wandered away from the land of the living in the caverns of hell for a period of time in order to satisfy the requirements of heaven of spiritual death. Even in the scapegoat we see that Jesus went to hell. My Lord. He was there for three days and three nights. But you know hell, in in this phrase hell, in the the, the original Greek, it has more than one part. It's actually got six, seven different levels. And paradise is one part that's not a prison. It's where the Old Testament saints went because they couldn't get to heaven yet because they hadn't been made righteous. So there's a place in hell. Remember Jesus said the rich man and Lazarus, there was a gulf between them. And the rich man, because of a sin, was in hell, the tormented part. And the, and the Lazarus was in, heaven, in the paradise part. And there was a great gulf between them. They could hear each other. They could talk to each other. They could sense. They could feel. He was in agony. He was thirsty. He said this quint, unquenchable fire. There was two different places in hell. Paradise and then the tormenting part. Now Jesus first went to the tormenting part because that's the price He had to pay for humanity. Now how long was He there for? We don't know exactly, but Romans 8, 11 says that the Holy Ghost raised Him from the dead. Not just put His spirit back in His body in the tomb, but took His spirit out of those prison bars where He was chained and where He was paying the price for me with spiritual death and separation from God. Dr. Dufresne had a vision once where he saw Jesus uh, and he saw the Holy Ghost blast Him out of those cells. And he came and he knocked the devil. He kicked the devil. That's the thing that he saw. I'm not exactly sure if that's how it happened. But he said he saw Jesus walk up with those long Galilean legs, he said. And he said he kicked Satan with his heel right in his forehead and knocked him backward off his throne. (laughs) Now whether that happened or not, I don't know. But the Bible does say that his head would be bruised by Jesus' heel. But the point is he was in that prison cavern for a period of time. We don't know how long. But can I give you a hint? I can't prove it and you can't disprove it. If he died at 3 p.m. and the next day started at 6 p.m., why would he say to the man on the cross, Today you shall be with me in paradise? Paradise is a place of comfort, not the place of torment. Now I've looked and studied what the word today means. Does it actually mean day or does it, what does it mean? It, it's interchangeable. It could mean today or tonight. So if it meant today and he died at 3 and the next day started at 6, he had three hours. If it meant night, it meant he had 15 hours till the next morning. I don't know how long he was in the prison for, but it wasn't that long. Whether it was three hours or 15 hours or I don't know, but he had a few things to do. What did he need to accomplish when he went down to hell? Are you still with me? Number one, he had to pay my price of separation. What number two? He had to go according to Revelations 1 verse 18, and he had to say to the devil, give me back those keys. And the Bible says in Revelations 1.18 that He took the keys of death and hell. He paid my price, then He got risen. He got broken out of those bars. I don't know how long He was sitting there for, but it wasn't that long because He had other stuff to do, and He set up to go visit the man in paradise. So He paid my price. He went and He took the keys, death and hell, away from Satan. Oh, and then my favorite part. He goes down to one of these distinct caverns of hell. It's a place that is only reserved for a certain group of people, and it's a place called Tartarus. 
And he Bible says in 1 Peter 3, 19 and in Jude 1, 6 that he preached to the spirits who were disobedient and left their first estate, and he preached to them in Tartarus after he took the keys. I'm trying to get you to picture what Jesus did for you. He went down and he preached to them. In my origins course, I explained it in great depth and detail, so I'm not going to take the time now. But you can trust my word, and you can go study it yourself. These spirits unequivocally, according to the original language, were the fallen angels that slept with Genesis 6, came down and slept with the woman of men to create a giant race, a giant race of giants like, like, like Goliath kind of people that were there to block the seed line, pervert the seed line so that Jesus couldn't be born because he had to come to the seed of David, or to kill the seed line so that Jesus couldn't be born. That is why the battle with David and Goliath is such an epic battle, because it was the seed of Satan, Goliath, trying to block the seed of Jesus which would come through David. The Bible says Jesus went, oh, I wish I could have heard that sermon. Can you imagine? He walks into that cavern and they're chained. The Bible says they're chained in chains of darkness. They're chained to the walls of that cavern. And Jesus walks in and he says, I want you all. He's preaching. The Bible says he preached to them. I want you all to know. I know what you tried. I know you tried it many times. I know you tried to snuff out my, my son David on whose throne I sit. But I want you to know you failed. I want you to know that the seed line was preserved, and I came, and I lived, and I've died, and it is finished. And I've redeemed the human race that you tried to block. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Jesus preached to those spirits. Now, can I tell you something my wife was going to tell the Bible school students, but I told her not to. I want to tell you something that will bless you. These were fallen angels that, as I said, were sent to block. Now, I want you to notice something. Now, I've, I've read theologians that believe this, and I've read theologians that don't believe this. But you decide what you believe. I can't prove it, but you can disprove it. But I believe this. Because it's just too many pieces that come together for this to be... This is amazing. David, the Bible says, decapitates Goliath. And he takes his head. You can see that stone sunk into his skull. And he's parading it around. That's how you get a head in life. And he's parading it around... And he's saying, look what God did. Right. Now, you study the Bible. The Bible says he takes the armor and puts it in his tent. But then he takes the head and takes it to Jerusalem. Right. Now, if you study the Bible, he is many years away from owning Jerusalem. He doesn't take Jerusalem until his, his eighth year as king. And he is still serving Saul. Theologians, some say he was 16 when he killed Goliath. Others say he was 19. So if you take the 16 figure, that means he was 21 years away from owning Jerusalem. If he was 19, he was 18 years away from owning Jerusalem. The point is, why would he take the skull, the decapitated head of this, of this giant, to Jerusalem that he doesn't even own? He can't get in. His enemies live there, the Jebusites. I believe he did it for two reasons. And this just inspires me. You take it or leave it. I believe he took that head and held it up outside the city and said, you see this? I'm coming for you. I'm taking this place. This is mine. You stand against me. This is what you're going to look like. I believe that's what he did. But he had to be outside the city in order to do that. Then you never hear mention of the head again. Not in Scripture. You hear mention of the sword. And of the armor, but not the head. And so some theologians posture, and I, I do believe them, that the reason you never hear of the head again after he takes it to Jerusalem, which we know had to be outside the city, because they were enemies of, of him, is because he buried the head outside Jerusalem. And that's why you never hear of it again. Now, it's a fascinating concept to consider that Jesus went to a place called Golgotha, and if you study, and theologians have studied the root of that word, Golgotha, Gol, G-O-L, Goliath, Goth, Goliath of Gath. His name was Goliath of Gath. And he went to a place called the place of the skull, called Golgatha. Is it possible? I'm just, I don't know. I'm just saying it. I just, it just freaked me out when I was studying him. Is it, is it possible? Is it possible that Goliath's skull represented Satan's master plan to block Jesus? Yes. And a thousand years later, 
Jesus at the place of the skull, Golgotha, died. The place of memory where Goliath was defeated and buried was the place that Jesus defeated Satan, who was the master of Goliath. Could it be that this is magnificent symbolism? Could it be that he bruised Satan's head or skull with his heel at that place called Golgotha? It's almost like David was saying, and we can't prove it, but you can't disprove it. It's almost like he was saying, I defeated the little one, but the Messiah is coming. And he is going to crush the skull of the big one. And I'm going to bury it at the exact place that he's going to do it. I don't know. It's almost like a seed was planted by David for the harvest reaped by Jesus. David defeated Goliath for a whole nation. Jesus defeated Satan for the whole world. Is it possible that where Golgotha, Goliath of Gath's skull was buried, that that is where Jesus snuck that devil's skull right in two? I don't know. But all I know is that he went to those angels and he preached to them. Maybe that was part of a sermon. We'll find out when we get to heaven. The point is, is that he won. Then he goes to paradise. You still with me? I told you this is a little bit of a sermon today, but you got to put up with me. You still with me? Your chicken won't burn. The angels are working. It's okay. He goes to paradise, which is the place of comfort. It's not a prison. And he cried. Now, oh my God, can you picture it? <sighs> He's paid my price. Give me those keys. He preaches a sermon to fallen spirits. And he comes. <laughs> oh my God, can you picture it, Jenny? He comes and he looks across the gulf at paradise, and every Old Testament saint that went before is straining to get a glimpse of the Messiah. Oh and he floats over that gulf. Can you imagine the roar? Oh David is shouting. Abraham is shouting. Adam is shouting. <laughs> Eve shouldn't be shouting because she got us into this mess, but she's <laughs> shouting. Every Old Testament saint lifts up their voice and Jesus comes across the gulf with the keys of death and hell and he says, I've come. Are you ready to go home and get out of this place? I've got a mansion ready for you. You've been sitting here a long time because my blood had to be shed. But now it's done. Oh, can you imagine the ext ecstasy? Can you imagine the demons in hell and Satan himself, how, how angry, how afraid, how astonished they must have been. Here they thought they had killed the son of glory and he actually beat them at their own game. Oh my gosh. He had to have been there, Taylor, with the man that day or that night. Because he said, today I'll be with you in paradise, which means he didn't spend that long in the bad place of hell. He did those three things, paid my price, took the keys and preached, and then he went over, and I believe the rest of the time was celebration, party. Every Old Testament saint wanted a piece of him. Every, when you get to heaven, that's the first one you're going to want to see. You don't care about grandma. Maybe you do, but I, I don't care about grandma. Give me Jesus. Where's my Jesus? Granny, get out the way. Give me Jesus. Where's my Jesus? Thank you, Granny, for showing up. I'm not interested in you right now. I want to see the one that I've loved my whole life. Oh, my God. I believe, Jenny, they had the greatest party paradise has ever seen. Woo! God. Number four, resurrection morning. Luke 9, 22 and 24, verse 7, Jesus said, I will rise on the third day. Romans 8, 11, the Holy Ghost blasted his body back, not just out his spirit out of that bars, but now his body, his spirit goes into his resurrected body. Yeah. And the angel rolls away that stone. Yeah. And that happened Sunday morning very early. Whew, my God. Now here's an amazing thought. Matthew 27, verse 52, it says this, that at the time of his resurrection, the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which had died arose and came out of the graves and went into the holy city and appeared to many. This is freaky. Yes, Jesus, get, listen, this is what he said to them. Are you with me? Because I'm starting to build now. So you can't get bored. I can, I can feel the anointing come on me to start to build now. Are you still with me? Jesus says to the Old Testament saints, boys, we're out of here. 
The wind is going to burn some time while I celebrate with you, but we're going out. And on the way up, we're going to stop. You're going to come. Some of you that were, that were buried in Jerusalem, you're going to come out. Go talk to people in the city and tell them about me. The Bible says that as he came into his body, the graves opened. The new Old Testament saints came into their bodies, their glorified bodies came out of those graves, and they went to the holy city and talked to many people about Jesus being the Messiah. It's astonishing to me. But he said, no, you can't take too long. You can't go talk to auntie and uncle. You just got to talk to, you know, your immediate family. Because we have a, we have a ticket. We have a ticket home. But while this is happening, and we don't know how long it was happening for, but while it's happening, all of a sudden Mary comes. Are you with me? Before I tell you about Mary, and I'm watching the clock, so don't worry, there's a perfect parallel to the life of Joseph. Joseph was a prince and had a robe of many colors. Jesus was the prince and had ultimate authority, yet divested himself of it, Philippians 2, 7. Joseph's brothers betrayed him and put him in a pit. Jesus' brothers, us, humanity... Betrayed him by breaking the covenant. And he left the glory of heaven to come to earth, which was like a pit. Joseph went to a faraway land called Egypt, which is known as the land of sin. And he worked as a servant. Jesus left the glories of heaven for a faraway land called earth, the land of sin. And he worked, the Bible says, as a servant. Joseph prospered in everything he did in part of his house. Jesus prospered at everything he did. Joseph was innocent, yet accused falsely of sin. Jesus was innocent, and yet took the sin of humanity on him. Joseph went into a dungeon, the Bible says, for three years. Jesus went into the caverns of hell for three days and three nights. Now listen now, this is the best part. Joseph, by the gifts of the Spirit, it was the gift of the word of knowledge, and the gift of the word of wisdom, operating to interpret those dreams. Joseph, by the power of the Holy Ghost, was raised in one day from the pit and the dungeon to the second in command of the highest office, the Pharaoh. And Jesus, by the same power of the Holy Ghost, was raised in one day from, the, from the, where Satan lived in hell, and he was put on the right hand of God, second in command, just like Joseph, of the God, the majesty on high. Everything in Joseph's life And Joseph used his position to save his nation, and Jesus used his position to save the world. I'm telling you, it's a perfect parallel. It's a perfect parallel. Jesus, when he came out, and they're all visiting the people in Jerusalem, he appears to four groups of people. The first one was Mary Magdalene. The second, later on, was three women. Uh, And these were uh, Mary, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. Then remember, later on, he appeared to the two on the road to Emmaus. And then later on, the 11 disciples, he walked through the wall, four groups of people on the day that he raised. When Jesus comes back on his white horse, and we'll be with him, the Bible says he will go to four groups of people, just like when he came out of that tomb. He will go to Armageddon first, he will go to the Mount of Olives and walk right through where the Muslims have tried to block the eastern gate, and he'll walk up to his throne. He will go to Petra where the Jews are hiding, and he'll go to Basra in southern Jordan. Four groups of people, he will come on a second, and four groups he came on his first. Look at the parallels of the Bible. You can't make this up. Let me tell you the story here very quickly. John 20, verse 1 to 18. He sees Mary Magdalene. This is what she does. She's running to the tomb first. She sees it empty. She runs back and tells Peter and John. They run down, and John says that he beats Peter. He's very competitive. He beats Peter. It says that in the Bible. They see the empty tomb. They leave. She's there crying outside the tomb. She looks in. Two angels say, while you're crying, he's risen. She turns around as she's weeping, and she sees a man standing there who she assumes is the gardener. Where have you taken him? And then he says, why are you weeping? Where have you taken him? She turns back around, the Bible says, and is weeping. And Jesus says in a sweet way, Mary. And just the sound of her name from his voice, she knew it was him. And she turned, the Bible said, and called him Rabboni, that means master. And she comes to fall at his feet. And Jesus says, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended unto my father. Why did he say that? Because he's holding his blood. And a sinner, any human being is a sinner, cannot violate that blood. Now, later on, not very long later, he comes back. Do you remember? And now Mary, and Mary the mother of James, and Joanna come to meet him. And the Bible says they run to him, and they hold his feet, worshiping him, and he lets them. Why? 
because something from the first Mary to the other three ladies happened. He, he went to heaven and he came back and put his blood on the mercy seat and that's why he could let them touch him. Remember he said, Thomas, feel my hands. Look at that. Jesus went somewhere. Where did he go? <laughs> Ephesians 4 verse 8. Turn with me there. Because now I'm on my last stretch and I want to talk to you about the robe. Ephesians 4 verse 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. The focus is the first two phrases. He sa- wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive. Before he could lead captivity captive, he had to complete his victory. You don't, per- you don't take prisoners until you've done your victory. Are you with me? Ascending meant three things. One, he put his blood on the mercy seat. That's why Mary couldn't touch him. Two, he completed the redemptive covenant. He ratified it. It was complete and finished. He had paid the spiritual price of hell. He had taken the keys of death. He had risen and he's put his blood down. It's done. He had to do that in order to seal his victory. And from that moment forward, Satan and all his cohorts had been defeated for eternity. No matter what you're going through today, Satan has been defeated. Once he placed his blood on the mercy seat, and he says, now, oh my God, I can't imagine this. you got to picture this with me. You thought the crowd shouted when he came across the gulf. He sees Mary, don't touch me. All those Old Testament saints come with him now. They've left Jerusalem, and they go up to heaven together. That's where he was taking them, to their new home. Now, can you picture it? He comes to those gates of pearl. They open Oh, we're going to see it when we get there. God recorded it all. Every angel bows on the streets of gold. Every Old Testament saint is at his back. Jesus is at the head of the line. God is on his throne sitting waiting for him. Every angel is prostrate before the Son of the living God as he comes with his holy blood and he walks up that path and he comes into God's throne room, the Holy of Holies, based on the heavenly tabernacle. And the Bible says he puts his holy blood on the holy mercy seat and he ratifies and completes the salvation covenant forever. This is the final act of victory. Now he has one more thing to do. The Revelations 19, 16 says, And he has on his vesture and on his thigh a name that is written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Philippians 2, 8 and 9, it says, God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name. Hebrews 8, 1 says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such a high priest who sat on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. This statement is a summary statement. He ascended on high. When you see this statement, it means so many things. He ascended to put his blood. He ascended to get that vesture. He ascended to get that name. He ascended to get that throne. Once he's done all this, he, all he has to do, Cola, to finish the entire thing for eternity, according to Hebrews 8.1, he has to sit. That's all he has to do. He's done it all. He has to sit. But there's something God gave him that is hidden in Scripture that is not overtly obvious, but I can prove it to you. There's something God gave him after he put his blood, and he's about to sit down as the conquering king of kings and lord of lords. The father gave him something. God gave him a royal robe. He put a robe on before he sat. Are you ready? As I conclude... Are you sure you're ready? Let me tell you this. In ancient times, kings wore elaborate robes to signify their majesty and authority. Robes were highly symbolic and held in great reverence. The longer the train of the robe, the train is the back hem. You know you have a robe, then you have a hem. That is called the train. It's only three inches, It's it's a hem. That's called the train. The longer the train or the hem, the more powerful the king was. Why? Hence, the longer the king's robe, okay, why? Let me tell you why. Every time in ancient times a king would defeat an enemy, he would cut a piece of the defeated king's robe, his royalty. He'd take a piece of it. 
and he would sew it onto the train or the hem of his robe as a permanent memorial and testament that he had vanquished that king. And everywhere he went, people could see, this is the king, and then he'd have patchwork. Oh, look at that king. I recognize that insignia. Oh, look at that coat of arms. I recognize that insignia. And the longer the king's robe, the more powerful the king was because he would take vanquished kings and add it to his robe. Now, this is fact. I'm not making this up. You can read this on your own if you're interested. Celtic sources speak of kings cutting off portions of the defeated king's robes and adding it to theirs. Persian sources were a bit more particular. They didn't like what the other king's robes looked like. They were more fussy. So instead of cutting off their robe, what they would do is they would add a piece of their own material to their hem, and they would hem in it with gold thread and fine gems a record of the victory over that king. So sometimes they'd cut the robe and sew it. Other times they'd put their own piece with gold thread and gems to signify the victory over that vanquished king. So the longer the robe was, the greater the king was. Do you understand? It was therefore punishable by death to cut a king's robe. People don't realize that. Why? When you cut a robe, you were saying you were insulting his authority, and you were even saying you would vanquish. You had vanquished him. A robe, a king's robe was never to be touched. It was a holy thing. This is why Jesus' garment, his robe, could not be ripped. It wasn't just because it was without seam and it was an expensive garment. That's part of it. But the Roman soldiers, it was, God would not permit them to rip that robe because that robe represented Jesus' authority. If the Romans had ripped that robe, it would have insulted the Son of God's authority and it would have meant that they had vanquished him. Jesus gave his life, but he was never to be vanquished. Just like it says he couldn't break his bones. God moved upon the minds of those men to do it differently. They broke the other men's bones, but they didn't touch his bones. Why? Because it was prophesied. God would not permit them to rip that robe. Why? Because it would have, it would have represented that Jesus had been vanquished. And Jesus can never be vanquished. Do you remember in the, in, the, in the cave, David creeps up, and the Bible says he cuts a piece of Saul's robe. And then later he repents with tears that he did that. Why? Because David insulted the authority of Saul by cutting off a portion of his robe. It meant in that day, not to us, but it meant in that day, I have vanquished you, Saul. I have cut a piece of your robe off. And God rebuked him for it and said, you are not permitted to do that because it is not yet time for you to reign. When the time comes, you'll have your authority. You've now touched mine anointed. Don't touch my anointed. Look at that. Oh, my. So we see for every victory a king had, the hem of the train was made longer as a memorial or a record of his victory. The longer the robe, the greater the king. Now please turn quickly with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 1. It's only 12 o'clock. We are doing great, and I'm almost done, so be at peace. Peace, I leave I with you, the Bible says. Peace, be still. Oh, Jesus. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled <laughs> the temple. This is not a choo-choo train. The Christian Standard Bible says, In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated high on a lofty throne, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Every translation, I looked at 50 of them, either call it a hem or a train or the bottom edge. Isaiah was the most blessed man, in my opinion, to have ever lived because God saw fit to give him a glimpse into the future that no other human being, unless you were in heaven, saw. He saw, oh my God. Jesus put his blood. The Father handed him a robe. And God, listen to me now, God prepared a robe for his son. 
and into the hem of that robe was sewn with jewels and fine golden thread, a record of every victory that Jesus had wrought over every enemy that Jesus had vanquished. And because Jesus beat every name, every sickness, every sin, every torment, every, every dark work, every evil form, every name that can be uttered as the enemies of God, cancer was sewn into that robe. Mental torment, schizophrenia was sewn in golden thread and jewels into that robe. Financial poverty was sewn into that robe. Everything that you would ever face, God said, you have overcome all. I will now sow a record of your victory with every name that can be named that you have vanquished. I will sew it into the hem or the train of this royal robe, and it will be the longest robe that has ever been worn by any king. Why? Because you aren't just a king. You are the king of kings, and you are the Lord of lords. And I believe that God put a divine robe on Jesus of which the train and the hem had a record of every name that has been defeated from the history of the world till present. When he was on the cross, he whipped them, he broke them, them, he vanquished them, and every name and every enemy is sewn into that robe, and God put it on Jesus. Listen, and Jesus sat down upon a throne, and the train was so long, it was so long, it was so long, that it filled, it filled, it filled, it filled the entire temple. Can you imagine it? I'm not making this up. His robe, Jenny, just the hem, just the train, not the whole robe, just the train of it was so long. When he sat upon his royal throne, the entire Holy of Holies was filled with that train. Why? Because the name of what I suffer with was sewed into that robe. Jesus ratified the new covenant by putting his blood. And he said, Father, I have nothing more to do than to sit. And the father says, wait, I have something for you. Like the father gave Joseph a robe that was multicolored. I give you a robe. And every one of your vanquished foes is recorded in its hem. Now sit down, son, and become the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And God lets Isaiah have a glimpse of this glorious moment, and he sits down. But the train is so long because the vanquished foe list is so great that everywhere you look, you just see the train. So God said to me, so he said, now, son, he said, are you the temple of the Holy Ghost? I said, yes. He said, if my robe filled the temple and you are seated in me, Ephesians 2, 6, it means that my robe has filled your temple. Now, that's what he said to me. He said, if, if my victory and the record of my vanquishment is inside you, if it feels, if the revelation of this fills your temple like it filled the temple in heaven, then any time you go through life and something comes up to attack you or to stand against you, sickness, disease, torment, whatever, all you have to do, that's what he said to me. He said, all you have to do is turn around, son. Turn around and look. Ah, I see your name sewed in there, Mr. Devil. I see your name. If your name is in there, and that is in me, it means I, like Jesus, have vanquished you. It means you may assault me, but you cannot overcome me. Oh, my God. Turn around. We got to turn around. When the flu comes, turn around. Ah, you're in the, you're in the train. No, it's, all, it's done. You're in the train. You're in the train. 
When poverty comes, let me just, just give me one second, Mr. Devil. Oh, I see you. No, you're, you're done. Jesus, Jesus' robe is so long because the list is so long because he's overcome every name and there's nothing that he didn't overcome. And no matter what I face, it's in the robe. All I need to do is turn around. Look, is the name there? The name is there. The name is there. The name is there. My God. Jenny, when he showed this to me, you see, it doesn't say he put a robe on him, but he, Isaiah saw him with the robe. So I said, because I'm impertinent, I said, give me New Testament scripture or I won't preach this. And the Lord said, okay, I'll give you one. I know it's late, but let me give you the last scripture and then we'll close. Sit down. Just for one more second. I'm on my last page. I'm on my last page. My God. My God. I hope, I, hope it, I hope it hits you like it hit me. My God. The list. The list of vanquished foes is sewn with golden thread into his robe. And he sat down, King of kings and Lord of lords. And he was the unconquerable king for eternity. And his robe bears testament to it. Now we read there Ephesians 4 verse 8. Do you remember? Can I quote to you what the Amplified says about leading captivity captive? People have said for years, and they're idiots. They've said for years that this represents Old Testament saints. I guess they can't read Greek. If you study captivity captive in the Greek, it means exactly word for word this, to take an enemy as a prisoner of war. Jesus, did, the Old Testament saints were not his enemy. And he did not take them as prisoners of war into heaven. They were his brothers. When he led captivity captive, it's speaking of his enemies that he had taken a hold of. Now, let me tell you what the Amplified says, because this is the, I said, give me a New Testament verse. Yeah. And this is it. The Amplified version of Ephesians 4, 8 says, he ascended up on high and he led a train of vanquished foes. You look at it in your Amplified. To lead captivity captive in the original language means he led a train of vanquished foes. Even in the New Testament, hidden as a jewel waiting for somebody to search it out. The Bible clearly says that Jesus led. What does that mean, led? He went ahead of. Why? Because the robe's behind him. He is leading a train. You see, he can't bring demons into heaven. He can't bring sickness into heaven. It's too holy. So how is he going to lead prisoners of war while he's in heaven? They're not there. But the record of their vanquishment has been sewn into the train of his robe. They are the vanquished foes sewed into the train of his robe. That is what Isaiah saw. He ascended upon high, put his blood, put on his robe, and sat down. And then he stood up, because now it's done. You don't do the victory lap till you win the race. Then he stood up. And the Bible said he went on procession. People don't know this because they don't study their Bibles. He went on procession through the streets of heaven. It was this procession that he's referring to. He led captivity captive. It was this procession. He went out and led, went ahead of, and led a garment, a, a, tro- a train, a, a hem of his robe filled with the record of vanquished foes. And he paraded that robe through the streets of heaven. The devil wasn't up there. Demons weren't up there. Cancer wasn't up there. But their vanquishment was recorded in the hem of his robe. And he led a train, a hem of vanquished foes. My God. My God. Very quickly, Colossians 2.15. Because in rare, not rare, in typical form... God doesn't give you one verse. Brother Hagin always said out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, Father, your word says that every word be established. I said, Lord, I see the train. 
Yeah. Ephesians 4, 8. Yeah. But Lord, I need another verse for it from the New Testament or I can't preach it. I know Isaiah saw it, but I've got to have another verse. And he gave me Colossians 2, 15. Oh, are you ready? It's hidden for those that are hungry to search out the gold jewel. Yeah. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. There are three statements. Spoiled principalities. Number two, made an open show of them. Number three, triumphing over them in it. Let me tell you the first one has got a lot of, um, it's just poetic justice. There's a lot of irony here. To spoil a principality means to, to remove their robe from them. You studied in the Greek, it means to divest them of their authority. And a robe represents authority. When, I mean, this is just poetic. He spoiled the demons and the principalities that were in charge. He took their robe and he sold it into his. That's exactly what he did. To spoil them means to take their robe. I mean, it couldn't be more poetic. A show of them openly, listen to what it means in the Greek, to boldly in loud proclamation exhibit in public as a specimen or example. And in the Greek it signifies a public parade. He takes their robe and he says, I'll take that. I've beaten you. Your record is in mine. And I'm going to parade you around as you're, you're, you're defeated. Amen. Then he goes in a public spectacle this is when he did his victory lap in the streets of heaven. Now, are you ready for the last one? Triumphing over them in it. This is exactly what the Greek says, an acclamatory procession with noisy singing and clamor. And there was a subnote in the original Greek that I clicked on, and it gave me a little bit more definition. Are you ready for this? This will bless you. In Greek phraseology, this term, acclimated procession with noisy singing and clamor, is equated to, and I'm quoting now, ritual madness and religious ecstasy. Listen, before you get offended, this is, let me finish. Of the unrestrained consumption of wine and drunkenness in the worship of Dionysus or Bacchus, the Greek god of the grape harvest, who was the son of Zeus. Paul is searching by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit for a word and an example to give the church to express to them what Jesus was doing in heaven when he triumphed over them in it. And so he uses a term that is associated with the wine harvest festival. And in that time, of, if you study it, the one time of the year that was complete chaos and anarchy was the wine festival to Bacchus, which was the son of Zeus, Dionysus. When they did that wine harvest, Greg, there were orgies in public. Everybody was drunk as a skunk. Everybody was in the streets. People would run around naked. I mean, it was complete mayhem, drunken fest, and partying for an entire weekend. Full of sin. Sin abounds. Now, Paul is saying this. I don't know what other picture to give you. But as you know what it's like when you see this party in our streets, in the negative. Now picture that in holiness. In heaven, there was the most explosive, raucous, expressive, celebration, not with drunkenness and wine and sexual orgies, but with the most unrestrained joy that could possibly be fathomed as Jesus steps off his throne and he begins to walk down the steps of the heavenly tabernacle and every angel is shouting and every Old Testament saint is shouting and he's walking and the robe keeps going and he's walking and the robe keeps going. It's so long because there's a record of every Every enemy that's good has been defeated and the Bible says he walks he walks through the streets of the city he is on a procession he is having a parade and can you fathom the shouting the celebration the unrestrained madness if I could say madness in a good way 
Every angel is shouting. Every believer is shouting. Jesus walks and he says, I am the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Look, look what I've done. Look at my robe. Look at my robe. I've defeated all. I've defeated all. Look at my robe. My God. Guys, I don't realize, you don't realize between Mary and the other three ladies, that's what was happening. I've spent hundreds of hours studying this in the original. I'm not making this up. He put his blood. He received a robe. And he sat down. And then now that it's over, he stands back up and he says, I'm in the mood to dance. And he goes, no, he, that's the, he's equating it with the most ungodly, raucous party that they could ever imagine. But now it's become a holy, raucous party in heaven. And that means triumphing over them in it. There was a shout of joy in heaven that I'm telling you would wake those in the grave. Sit now as I, my last statement, because I'm done. Whether you got it or not, I don't know, but I'm done. <laughs> Let me give you the Craig Field translation of this verse. Spoil principalities, open show, triumphing over them. And I took every Greek word for all those things, and I put it together in a concise sentence. If you put all the Greek words in one sentence together and make it actually make sense, this is exactly what this verse says in the original language. Are you ready? A public celebration, an intense rejoicing in an acclamatory procession when Jesus boldly and loudly in outspoken proclamation, ecstasy and unrestrained joy exhibited publicly the grand spectacle of the devil's stripped authority, utter defeat and eternal vanquishment. That's exactly what the Greek says. You see, it's, it's waiting for somebody to root out the revelation of that. Because if you just read that, you don't really know what's going on. This is the procession. He led a train of... He couldn't have led it until he got the robe. And he couldn't have got the robe until he put his blood. And he sat down. Then he saw him. I see the king sitting down. Then he stands up and goes in a procession. And this procession is a public celebration, an intense rejoicing, and an acclimatory procession when Jesus boldly and loudly and outspoken proclamation, ecstasy and unrestrained joy exhibited publicly the grand spectacle of the devil's stripped authority, utter defeat, and eternal vanquishment. And he's got a robe, my brother. The robe of all robes. <laughs> Oh my God. Oh my God. I don't know, time in heaven is maybe different on earth. I don't know how long that was going on for. But during this time, these poor disciples are still crying. They don't know what's going on. Mary's seen him, she goes, none of them believe her. The girls believe more than the boys. Because the men said, you're crazy, woman. But the other two ladies said, you're on to something, let me come with you. And the three ladies come down, and Jesus has just come from this party of parties. And you know what he says when he sees them coming? You read in the Bible. He said a phrase and he preached. The Bible says he shouted it. And he said, all hell! I thought it meant all hell me, I'm the king. And it could mean that too. But in the original language, what he said in, in the Greek language, it translates it better. What he actually said is not all hail. What he said was, rejoice! <laughs> there, there. <laughs> the, the boys, the big tough boys are in there hiding. I don't believe it. I don't believe he's alive. And he's just had the party of all parties in heaven. And the first thing that comes out of his mouth is rejoice because he's just come from the epitome of rejoicing and they run to him the Bible says and they grab him by the feet and Jesus does not say stand back because now it is accomplished hallelujah hallelujah do you remember when Jonathan gave David a robe it was part of the covenant ceremony 
Do you remember when the father gave the prodigal son a robe? It was part of the sonship ceremony. God loves us so much that he's given us this robe. Do you remember the king gave Mordecai a robe? It speaks of authority. When Jesus gave you this robe, Reverend Greg, what he's saying is, this is a symbol of my covenant with you. This is a symbol of my authority I give you. Remember Mordecai? This is a symbol of my sonship. You are my son. Only sons get to wear robes. Hallelujah. <laughs> he ascended upon high to complete the victory. He led captivity captive to parade with the robe, symbolizing that victory. And then the last phrase of that verse says, and he gave gifts unto men. He ascended to complete it. He led captivity to demonstrate it and celebrate it. And then he gave you a pastor to teach you about it. The very first thing that he did after the parade is he breathed gifts into the earth. Five-fold ministry gifts, prophet, apostle, pastor, teacher, evangelist. Think about how important it is to God that the five offices are listed in the same incredible verse as ascending, blood, receiving rope, as leading captivity, a, vanquished, a train of vanquished foes, the celebration, in the same breath that God talks about these things bigger than life, he says, and he gave you a pastor. He ascended to complete it. He led captivity captive to celebrate it. And he gave you a pastor to teach you about it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Father, you've given us a robe in covenant like David and Jonathan. You've given us authority like the king and Mordecai. You've given us sonship like the father with the prodigal son. You've given us your Victory, as your robe filled your temple, the revelation of your outstanding, magnificent victory fills our temple. Lord, let this record of your victory over every name, let it fill the temple of these people. Let the revelation of God come and stir them from the inside out. Lord, if they will allow it, if they will get revelation of it, this will change their life. I know we say that all the time, but I really mean it. Lord, this revelation has changed my life. When tests and trials come, when fear comes, when devils come, when sickness comes, I, I, do, it, I do the action on purpose, not to be legalistic, but to remind myself that the robe is in me. The victory is in me. And I turn around and I look and I say, no, Mr. Devil, I see that that you're trying to put on me. I see that that's marked in the robe. God, with golden thread, put an eternal testimony of Jesus' vanquishment over this thing. It's in his robe. He paraded it through heaven. They celebrated it in heaven. My pastor has taught me about it on earth. That robe, that victory is in my temple. It's in me. I'm a son. I'm a covenant man. I've been given divine authority. Now, Father, because I see the name of my adversary sewn into that robe, I begin to use that authority and I begin to bind him. And I begin to tell him that he will not touch me or my children. And then I begin to celebrate like they did in heaven. You can't just use your authority to bind. You've got to start to rejoice. In the rejoicing, power flows. Imagine the celebration in heaven as he walked the streets of glory with this acclamatory procession and this ex explosive joy. That is a measure of what we must have in our bedrooms. When the enemy attacks and you find his name in your robe, start to dance like they did in heaven. Start to command with your words because you've been given this authority in earthen vessels. Don't ever let the devil lie to you again and tell you that what he's throwing at you is too big for you. That what he's throwing at you, uh, you can't overcome. You just turn around. 
and say, no, Mr. Devil, I see what you're saying, but it's in Jesus' robe. And his robe is in me. And the testament of his victory is mine because I'm in him and he's in me. And I command you to back off and I begin to dance and celebrate as they did when they triumphed over him in it. And if you'll do this, if you'll use your mouth with your authority and if you'll use your feet with your dancing as an act of faith, I'm telling you the power of God will destroy and decimate whatever is in your path. Why? Because Jesus already decimated it. And it's in his robe. My God, what a revelation. What help, Father, for us today. I've done my best, Father. I tried to lay the stage for them with all the other information, but I really do believe they got the punchline. I believe they got electrocuted today. Let them never forget this as long as they live. Some of you, by the Holy Ghost, I hear him saying, some of them, son, even today, are struggling with, a, with severe attacks, with severe depression, with severe things that are banging on their mind. Tell them to go home, to turn around and say, no, Mr. Devil, it's in the robe. I command you to stop and then begin to dance like they danced on the streets of heaven. And you'll see the power of God will set you free. Praise Jesus.